Ah, yes, and we have finally reached the year 2022, which means that it is time for me to engage in a tradition I started a few years back that I just am not going to let go, no matter how hard I try. We are going to do every game I played from 2021 ranked best to worst. And it was a very interesting year for gaming. There were some standout hits. There was a lot of mediocre stuff. There were going to be more entries on this list. To be honest with you, there were just some that I haven't gotten around to playing. And frankly, if I waited to play all of those, this would probably be coming out sometime in the middle of the year. So I will eventually do a video talking about the, the other games from the year that I really wanted to play. But we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, instead, we are going to talk specifically about games that got their actual release in 2021. And that is a little tricky nowadays, just because with early access and game previews and all of that, it is a little bit harder to tell when games actually get, you know, quote-unquote released. But I'm going to do the best job that I can. So, we have 31 games to get through, and we are going to start at the best. Number one on my list is probably not going to surprise most people. It is Psychonauts 2. Um, Psychonauts 2 is one of those games that looks visually stunning when you actually get into the game. Its first impression is a good one. But where it really shines is in its writing and its character design, and most notably, its level design. These are not cookie-cutter, uh, you know, levels that you see in platformers. Not at all. These are going through people's psyches and digging in layer after layer after layer to tell a rich narrative. Most of the voice actors returning as well uh, to, to voice this, even though the original one came out like 13 years ago, but it doesn't feel like the team at Double Fine has missed a beat. Um, uh, the music and the sound design and the, the uh, voice acting, all of the facets of it are just of, of a quality that you don't normally see from AAA titles. And here, they just shine. It's the kind of game that you can tell was done as a labor of love not as a cash grab, and that is a further and further rare occurrence in today's market. Number two, though, I probably spent a lot more time with, which was Everspace 2. Technically, this is in early access right now, but it's available to the public, and I have to tell you that if you were to go and pick it up now, you would find more than enough content. They kind of took what was the, the Ubisoft model in some ways of creating this large open world, but with a space game, and yet it's arcadey, and it doesn't feel so utterly vast that you can't get around it. They did something really smart with Everspace 2. They have an overarching map, but then you go to individual systems. So in so many space games, you'll start to feel overwhelmed because the vastness of space is just that. It is vast, and they have you travel through it, and then occasionally you'll find something interesting inside of it. Everspace 2 kind of takes that idea and says, no, 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 we're, we're not going to bother with the vast open spaces. We're going to try to get you to the good stuff as quickly as possible. And the combat, the combat is terrific. Just absolutely great. The customization that you can do with this game uh, for dogfighting, for your own fightership, is great. And um, none of the facets of it felt particularly grindy or annoying to me. And it does have a lot of work left to do, but even in its current state, it is a real joy to play. Number three, The Ascent. I am so happy that we have some original IPs on here, and The Ascent is one of the best I've seen. This is the first game from Neon Giant, and it is the definition of a twin-stick shooter. And it tries not to be much more than that. It's got RPG elements and everything, but what they really wanted to focus on is being a twin-stick shooter that is the best version of itself that they could make it. There's this uh, wonderful mechanic in the game, actually, where you can be down, down here, like shooting from the hip, or you can raise your gun up like this if you're aiming, but the neat thing about that is that they use that mechanic to determine if you're hitting low or if you're hitting high. And if you are actually 
uh, firing over cover, or if you are firing at like low low lying enemies, because you might find that you're not hitting any of them because you're always trying to aim in. They do some really interesting things with the mechanics, but the real standout is just how much they have populated this world with. Not just the individual levels, but just the number of assets. You get into the cities in this game, and there is just so much. It is just overwhelming in some ways, the amount of stuff that is just bombarding your eyes <laughs> when you get in to these, these towns and these cities. So much personality, something interesting around every single corner. And the customization that you can do for your characters, uh, the different ways that you can actually play, even though it is a twin-stick shooter, are really remarkable. I think that they did an absolutely excellent job, and I commend them for it. Can't wait to see what they do next. Okay, next up is Forza Horizon 5. I will admit, I actually haven't played as much of Forza Horizon 5 as I might have liked. And I'm not going to necessarily tell you it's as engaging. Having played a lot of the other installments, I didn't find that, like, it's more of the same. So I know what to expect. That does not, however, mean that it is bad. First of all, the graphics are near photorealistic. It is vastly impressive, the technical aspect of this. But the biggest thing that Forza Horizon has going for it, and 5 continues this all over the place, is the idea of making a racing game that is just fun. There's no sim elements to this. You can obviously get new parts, and you can tune your car, and you can do all of those deeper elements, but it's not going to make it so that you have to rely on that. You want to just jump into one of these supercars that you might just end up getting with a wheel spin pull at random and jump into them and just run roughshod over the terrain, off-roading it, uh, running through bushes. You can do all of that, and it's not really going to penalize you. In fact, in a lot of ways, it encourages you to do that. You can get a score modifier for actually going over that brush and, and, you know, banging up the fences and stuff like that. It's an arcade racer that takes a lot of the more boring or frustrating elements of a lot of racing games and just kind of throws those off to the side and says, no, what we're going to do is we're going to get you in some cool cars, it's not going to take long for that to happen, and you're going to run around this beautiful landscape, having races, going on giant set pieces, exploring what's here, finding barn finds, the whole deal, and we're cutting out any of the boring or tedious parts. Good for them. Playground Games delivers yet again. Number five is not necessarily the most proficient game in terms of technical aspects, but it is one that I played for an inordinate amount of time, and I think it's got real legs for the future, and that's Medieval Dynasty. Um, there's uh, a lot of resource gathering and survival aspects to it, and some people might find it to be tedious, but I thought that it had enough gameplay loops going for it that it was actually able to keep me engaged, and I never felt like I needed to bail on it. Well, it took me a long time before I had to. The encumbrance issue is definitely an issue. I never liked that aspect, and it made me basically stand in place, unable to move on more than one occasion, because you do end up picking up a lot of logs and stone and stuff, and, and they weigh you down very quickly. But I really enjoyed the idea of actually building your own civilization, you know, uh, going to any place on this map and starting to build houses, starting to build taverns and blacksmith shops so that you can do crafting, or that you can attract new people to your settlement so that they can be the blacksmith, so that you can, you can have them run the taverns or the herbalist hut, or, you know, harvest the crops from the farm. I thought all of that was just a really interesting, innovative idea, and they did implement it well. It needs more in the way of story content, um, missions, like, more goals and objectives, Obviously, it's not a perfect game, but they are continually improving upon it, and I, I do have to say that it's one of those games that I just found myself continually playing, regardless of whether it made sense that I was playing it or not. So you know what? 
Good on you, Medieval Dynasty. That's a hard thing to do. Number six is uh, Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep, a Wonderland's one-shot adventure. Yeah, don't at me. I know that this is basically just a, a standalone version of the DLC that came out for Borderlands 2, like, eight years ago, whatever. I don't care. I, I don't care. It's, it's still Borderlands. And what they did with that was, was really good. If you have played Assault on Dragon Keep, which you probably should have, then there might not be a lot of new stuff here, but I did appreciate that they had, like, the Ludipults and the Kite Shields. They did add stuff in, uh, even some of the missions from the main game that they, they added into this setting and creating this very specific uh, Wonderlands setting that is completely separated from what the Borderlands would experience would be otherwise. I thought it was a very good idea. It's a smart idea, too, especially with Wonderlands coming very shortly. It is, however, to be fair, one of the best pieces of DLC that Borderlands has ever created. And so to make it its own little thing all to itself makes perfect sense and deserves to be played by a new generation that might not be familiar with it from the time it originally came out. And boy, that makes me feel old. Number seven is... Okay, it's Deer Simulator. I know. It's, it's stupid. It's pointless. It, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But it's also one of the most hilarious things I played this year. No, it is the most hilarious thing I played this year. It's just ridiculous for the sake of ridiculousness. It's not made by the same people that made Goat Simulator. I know a lot of people ask that question. It is not. Different company. But you might as well consider it that. And when you get to the end game content, it's just trippy. It's just trippy. And I can't tell you it's a well-made game, but I don't think that was the point. <laughs> I really don't. It is there to be just a bundle of just a hot mess. And, but it is an amazing hot mess <laughs> for the short time that you're playing it. It's going to feel weird to talk about this game after I just talked about Deer Simulator, but number eight is Sable. If there was one game on this list that I really should have spent more time with, and I think I bailed on too quickly, I think it's Sable. The thing that this game does so well is it takes the idea of exploration and it makes it a focal point. There's no real combat in this game, like you normally assume. There's no health bar in Sable. It is this wireframe cell shade animation, and they do this wonderful thing where when the sun goes down, the colors just fade out completely, and when the sun comes back, all of these colors, all of these grids just kind of fill back in with color, and so it's on this day-night cycle. It just encourages you, though, to, without a lot of direction without a lot of explanation, go off into the landscape and uncover the secrets of it as you move through its narrative. If you liked the way that games in the past, before the, the open world genre really took over, like the Ubisoft model of here's 50 million objectives on the map, which ones do you want to do, but really just told you, hey, there's some stuff to do here, but you kind of have to figure out what that is then you're going to like Sable a lot. Uh, just kind of going on your little jet bike across this landscape and watching as it fades from night to day, night to day, is a uh, real joy. And I have to say that it is one of the more innovative titles that has come out this year. You know, remakes aren't always good, but when they are good, it's worth talking about them. And this year we had Mist 2021. Mist gets a full revamp. And it is welcome, because so many of the problems that I experienced with Mist way back in the day have been completely corrected with this. For instance, uh, you used to have the point-and-click sort of model where you would go frame to frame to frame. And that was fine for the time. This was the 90s, right? But now you can actually walk around the map. Oh, wow. That is a huge deal for me. Uh, the graphics have been completely overhauled. The whole thing feels much easier to understand now. Like in a puzzle game like Myst, 
I think that the puzzles were always good, but the way it was laid out was not. In some ways, that's because of the technical limitations of the time, but now with this version, they're able to move away from that. They are not hindered by those technical limitations, and they were able to create the kind of game that we all might have in, you know, our... our rose-colored glasses thought mist was back in the day, but it, it is like that now. Number 10 I have on my list as Boyfriend Dungeon. Boyfriend Dungeon is an interesting enough game, but it is an odd one. The idea behind it is that you go into these dungeons that are sort of randomly generated. They call them the Dunge. You basically dungeon chill, and the reason I say that is because you date your weapons. This is a world where weapons turn into people. Yep, that's what happens. You create a relationship level with your weapons, and then date them, and, and then go on dates with them when you max out a level uh, in the real world when they're a person. And... Uh, each one of them has, like, individual storylines. It's a, it's a strange game, but it's actually a pretty enjoyable one. I was surprised. You wouldn't necessarily think that, like, the random generated dungeons that you would uh, imagine from, like, a Diablo uh, mixed with a dating simulator would work, but somehow it does. Now, the general through lines of the story, some of them are better than others, and some of them might seem a little um, problematic, as many people have mentioned by this point, and that is all warranted. Um, I think that they made some serious missteps in the storytelling here and how it's presented, but the actual game itself is pretty good. It's, it's different. The dungeons have enemies like, you know, what are they, staplers? They're like, there's a lot of office supplies that you fight in this game. It's, it's again, it's an odd game, but I kind of like odd games. Number 11 is, I need to read this, Space Warlord Organ Trading Simulator. I bet you didn't even know that was a game, but here we are. The general idea behind this is you are basically a, uh, a trader on the Intergalactic Stock Exchange, and you buy organs that you can then sell to desperate people who need those organs. And sometimes they need certain grades or certain sizes of those organs. And you are also competing against other people, uh, other aliens, I guess, that are also trying to get those uh, organs because they want to sell them too. And this eventually leads you to one of multiple endings depending on which of these factions you've helped out the most, and trying to upgrade your cargo capacity so that you can have more organs. It's, um, you know, it's an odd game, but in some ways, I think that it has a, a lot to say. <laughs> it has a lot to say about the lucrative, lucrative career in, in organ farming. Maybe that was the wrong lesson I was supposed to take away from this game. Um... But it's, it's an interesting one. I had fun with it. I got through to an ending where I think a religious cult uh, was able to raise an ancient demon from a sarcophagus. So that's, that's probably a lesson somewhere. Number 12 recently came out. It's called The Gunk. And I'm, again, I'm not going to tell you that it's the greatest game of all time, but I think that as a platformer with the unique mechanic of being able to suck up this uh, goo, the gunk, that is around this world as you and your partner are uncovering a lot of these uh, secrets of a lost civilization and the people that were there before and what they were trying to do, I, I think that it's a, it, it's a well-done enough game. It, it looks very nice, and it plays pretty solid. It is really more of a, a traditional adventure game in the way that it is framed, and it's not particularly long, but in that, it also doesn't wear out its welcome, and I think that they do enough of a job really putting this whole thing together into one solid enough package that it deserves credit for that. 
Number 13 is one, I, sometimes I'm on the fence about it, but I just kind of like the idea, and it's Lake. Lake was the game during the Summerfest that I couldn't play because the demo had already expired. But anyway, I have actually gotten a chance to play the game itself. You are this uh, lady who has gone to her hometown she's been away from for 22 years because her parents went on vacation. Your dad is a mailman in this small lake town. And so you're going to take over his route for the couple weeks that he's away. I, I didn't know that that was a thing you could even do. That doesn't seem right. I, I don't think you can do that. I don't think that somebody goes away on vacation and just kind of go, Hey, my kid will do my job for two weeks. Never heard of that. But then again, it's also set in the 80s. So maybe, maybe it's an 80s thing. I, I don't know. I'm an 80s thing. So the game mostly consists of you getting letters and packages and then going to the houses where you need to deliver those. And in a lot of instances, talking to the people who you are delivering the mail to. And that's how you create interconnected like relationships with people. This is how you get the, the narrative. Because it really is more of a narrative game with this one mechanic of delivering the mail to all these people in the town. But I kind of like that framework. You know, it's, it's got a little bit more meat on the bones and more of an exploratory sort of uh, way of looking at this where you're delivering the mail over these two weeks... Um, and actually have to go somewhere and do something that makes it a little bit more substantial than just the the regular narrative game like a, a Dear Esther. Because in a lot of ways, it's trying to tell a story about people in some ways like uh, maybe like a Life is Strange, although it's not as good as Life is Strange, I'm not going to tell you that. But uh, the, the idea that they tried to create more of a framework about the gameplay it's a really interesting one, and let's face it, in terms of the uh, games where you are a, a postal worker, it's got to be the best one, right? Hi, Editor Nathan here in the middle of the video, just uh, remembering uh, right around this time that there were actually a couple games that I forgot to put onto this list when I originally recorded. Uh, one of them was a game I had just played when I was doing this editing called The Wild at Heart. And then another one was uh, something I actually did on Mine, uh, which was Moonglow Bay, which actually did come out this year. And I, I don't know why I forgot it, but I figured that I'll just put these two somewhere in the middle, almost as honorable mentions, because uh, I did think that they were pretty good, uh, maybe not the, the best, but they were definitely worth note. Uh, real briefly, Moonglow Bay is sort of like a Stardew Valley, but if it was voxel graphics instead of a pixel graphics, and if it was set more around the uh, a fishing town where the idea is to catch a lot of different fish and, and crayfish, and has a general storyline that's supposed to be about, you know, uh, loss and love and trying to rebuild your life, you know, it's kind of what those farm management kind of sims are. It works perfectly fine, but I can't tell you that it's as good as a Stardew Valley. It feels a little static by comparison, but uh, I think it, it, was, it was engaging enough that it might be worth trying if you like Stardew Valley. Uh, the Wild at Heart is an interesting little game. The graphics are really neat. Uh, almost like a, a hand-drawn art style that they wanted to do for this. And the gameplay kind of revolves around the idea of getting these little sprites uh, from the forest and having them, uh, you know, perform different tasks for you. And sometimes you need to get a, a certain number of them so that they can move boulders and knock down walls and stuff. And if that sounds a lot like Pikmin, you're right. It is it is very similar to Pikmin in its framework. That's not a bad thing because besides, you know, the Pikmin series, there really hasn't been a lot of game series that have taken that up. And I thought that The Wild at Heart, uh, even though I haven't played a ton of it, did that formula really nicely and laid it out in a really nice framework with uh, fun characters and kind of a quirky atmosphere. So there you go, you get two bonus games. They'll be in the middle somewhere around the place I think that they should probably belong. And Nathan from the future out. 14 is a bullet hell game set in more of a medieval 
setting, and it's called Arch Fail. Sometimes incredibly frustrating, as you go through Zelda-like dungeons, trying to dodge a ton of projectiles that are coming at you non-stop, but it is also pretty satisfying when you actually take out some of the bosses. However, I don't necessarily think it's substantial enough that I would recommend it. It's more frustrating than fun. I found myself it's probably a 60-40 split, and that might speak to the difficulty of the gameplay and the richness of the gameplay, but it also speaks to me not wanting to play it. And that's kind of the more important thing for me. Echo Generation was a game that I played during Summerfest, but then I got to play the full game. I didn't play through the entirety of it, mostly because the mechanics are interesting enough of doing like a turn-based RPG, but set more in like that 80s Stranger Things sort of setting, where there are indeed ghosts and aliens and all of this stuff. And the voxel graphics are interesting enough, they're different, but I also found that... Uh, the gameplay relies very heavily on these boss battles with not a ton of stuff in between. And there's not a lot of save points as well. So what it tries to do is, is keep you in these places where you have to deal with this giant boss that you're really not prepared for and that you've probably had to fight like two or three small guys before so that you don't have full capacity when you get to the big bad guy. And they rely very heavily on that. There's a lot of encounters where you think you know what you're going to get into, and then all of a sudden there's like 15 more enemies in front of you. And it's just, it's annoying. They don't present the challenges well enough ahead of time. And uh, the aesthetic's interesting, and the setting is interesting. But the game... Well, maybe not the game. Lost Words Beyond the Page is a platformer game where you actually use words to do things, like uh, lift or elevate would be a word that you could use to actually lift yourself up or lift a platform up. Uh, from the very beginning, you are dancing along these words as if they are the landscape. It was written by Rihanna Pratchett, and the idea behind it is that you're going through these chapters that in many ways are teaching about the stages of grief, and that's all really cool, and I just wish that I was more engaged with the gameplay because it's very rudimentary platforming that did not make me want to play it, even though I think it's a pretty short game. Um, I was able to get through maybe like the first or second chapter, but not really past that because I had other things to play, and I kind of knew where the story was going to be headed, uh, it's not, it kind of wears itself on its sleeve. That's all really unfortunate, and um, I, I just, I wish there was more meat on the bones. Alex is probably going to kill me for putting this so low on the list, but number 17 is Curse of the Dead Gods. Um, I respect Curse of the Dead Gods as a roguelike, but it is also a roguelike. I'm not a fan of that genre. I, I don't like it. I've tried some great ones that are pinnacles of their class. I've tried Hades, and I can't even do Hades. I don't like, I didn't like Hades from a gameplay standpoint. Like, I don't. I don't do that genre. I'm not a fan. Um, and unfortunately, Curse of the Dead Gods is very much a roguelike. And the, the real mechanic about it that I was not happy with is this idea that usually you have some progression as you're going through these dungeons. Curse of the Dead Gods more or less focuses on the idea of negative progression. You start getting curses. You start uh, accruing problems uh, and darkness as you're going through these, these levels. And there's something about that negative progression loop that turned me off of it in general. I respect that it did something different, I just don't think I like the different thing it tried. Chris Tales, so this was like a turn-based RPG where you can actually see into the future and the past when you get into these sections. Actually, the entire game is kind of formatted so that you can see the future and you can see the past, and as you do things, you'll see the future change, and you can actually go into the past, and, and you have this little friend that helps you out, goes into the past and can change things so that you can modify the present, and that will actually help the future. And it's a very interesting mechanic. If the game was more interesting or fun, it probably would have been a real winner. 
The problem is, is that the actual gameplay when you get into it, the turn-based RPG thing, is pretty standard except that you have these time powers. And they introduce it in a really interesting way, but it's not engaging. And this whole way that it's presented to you so that you're always seeing these three different time frames is a little disorienting, actually. I, I kind of would have liked to be able to turn them on or off at any time, and you don't really have that option. So, really interesting idea, but I didn't like the way it was presented to me. Okay, 19. This is where we get to Outriders. Um, there are some people that would probably put this way lower on the list. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that I did actually play it for quite a bit of time, and I thought that in terms of trying to do Destiny, it did an okay job of it, but it was released in a not a great state out of the gate. I know that they've been doing work on it since, but I don't really want to encourage these companies to produce content that isn't actually ready, especially when they're big studios. I can understand it more when it's like a, an Everspace 2. Outriders is coming from like Square. You have the resources, guys. You can you can just produce the game in its entirety. You don't have to wait on it. And it is pretty generic stuff, like when you actually get into it. It's pretty much go into an arena, get behind chest high cover, fire at things as they come to you until there's nothing left, rinse, repeat. Uh, it looks fine, it plays pretty well, but it's not really doing anything spectacular. Surgeon Simulator 2 is a game that I basically did the backseat gamer thing for. I didn't play a lot of it myself, but it was keeping my nieces and nephews pretty occupied when I booted it up. Uh, I think that the problem with it, though, is that it really did take, like, two of them to actually work the controls for this. Someone working the computer, someone working the mouse. It, it felt like you needed more than two hands to actually do this, which is weird because the majority of the game is just trying to make your hand do things and rotate your hand to wherever the position should be. It's an odd game. Uh, it's not supposed to be taken seriously. Uh, but it is good for a few laughs, and if you have young children in your house and you would like to keep them occupied for a little while, yeah, this this will probably do that. Dodgeball Academia tries to take the idea of an RPG and put it in a dodgeball academy, hence the name. And it is interesting in that you can actually use these dodgeballs, try to block them so that you don't take damage, or try to avoid the attacks, uh, because it is kind of being done in real time, and then taking your dodgeball and trying to throw it at your enemy and hope that they don't block it. It's an interesting idea for a game. It is also kind of too in love with its own concept, honestly. Uh, there, there are these games that seem like they're just so pleased with themselves. <laughs> dodgeball Academia is one of them, and once you start to realize what the mechanics of it are, and some of your super moves that you can do, I wondered what the point was to continue playing, because I kind of knew how the rest of the game was going to be. Uh, oh, we're going to another dodgeball class, and then I have to go to the tournament, and I guess I win the tournament. Art style's really interesting. I like that. I liked uh, how it was presented, but eh, it's not my cup of tea. Speaking of not my cup of tea, the next one on this list is Scarlet Nexus, and I really just played the demo for this, but I was able to play both of the different scenarios because I just wanted to see the different characters. I have to tell you, though, that after playing both of those characters and everything, the game pretty much plays the same way. There's not a lot of differentiation except for the characters themselves, and... I found that the combat was pretty rinse and repeat for the majority of it. It's literally just, uh, okay, I hit something a lot of times, and oh, now I can do a combo move, and I get my other person involved, and we do a combo move, and blue, and then I get orbs uh, attached to me, and oh, there's another enemy, and I attack a little bit, and oh, I can do a combo move. And uh, as you're going up through these, you know, uh, towers and fairly linear pathways, from one 
enemy that we do a combo move on and then pull the core out of and move on to the next thing. Not a lot of variety, not a lot of variety in the enemies even, and not a lot of variety, very little variety in terms of the gameplay. Death Trash had some real potential and maybe the name was what turned a lot of people off of this. But, like, there's flesh monsters in this. That's got to be something. There's a button you can press to puke. And then you use that as lubrication on things. It's trying to do a lot of things. Um, the problem is, is that what it's not trying to do is create a cohesive or interesting game that you want to play for a long period of time. And that's kind of an important thing. 24. Lawnmower Simulator. I fell asleep after about five minutes. I woke up. I was still sitting on the lawnmower. That's pretty much all I have to say about that one. You can imagine that everything below lawnmower simulator is going to be a problem, right? These are... I, I would have preferred to fall asleep <laughs> during that. Dark Alliance. I regret having played this. I really shouldn't have done that. It is not like the original Dark Alliance at all. Uh, instead of doing the top-down Diablo-style hack-and-slash game that the original one that was that people liked, what they decided to do this time was do a, a third-person action game where you go into individual acts, have to run through that act to its conclusion, and then you get your collected rewards for that run. And if you can't do it, you forfeit all the rewards that you might have gotten up to that point. The concept of it would have been okay, I suppose, although I wasn't a real big fan of just not getting stuff when you actually get that, but you have to wait till the end for it to actually matter. Or the idea that if I do fail at any time, I go back to the last checkpoint, usually the beginning if you want to get modifiers at, at the different campsites, uh, and then have to like go through everything all over again. Or, as I found out later, just try to run past everybody, which you can do in most instances. That wouldn't have necessarily been a problem. But the big issue that Dark Alliance has is that it's not well made. You can literally snipe people if you have, like, a, a caddy brie uh, from outside an arena or from a high point, and you can just keep wailing away on enemies that do not react to you whatsoever because they, they do not notice you or care if you are not specifically in the area they have been assigned to. There are just a lot of technical issues with it that make no sense like that. I, I frankly didn't care about the storyline at all. It didn't matter to me whatsoever. Um, you fight goblins. You need an excuse to fight goblins and ogres and trolls and such. Pretty much it. I was kind of surprised with their four choices for characters you can play. There are no, like, magic classes. There's pretty much three different fighters. And there's a long-range character. Like, one archer, and then the other three are different variations of melee fighters. You, you couldn't even give me some more variety in the character you could play? Come on, folks. An, an absolute insult to people who were looking for the revitalization of Dark Alliance. Cash grab. Feels like an absolute cash grab. Hey, speaking of cash grabs, GTA San Andreas Definitive Edition. The only reason it gets this much credit is because it is still GTA San Andreas. But it's the worst version of it. I think that it's so funny that it's the v Definitive Edition and it is a worse version than the original. The graphics are better. Sometimes, kind of. Depends on how you want to quantify that. Uh, but the music is lacking. The gameplay didn't really get much improvement. Still felt pretty much the way it was before. Um, the rain is... It, it hurts my eyes. And you do start to realize when you go back to the games like this that you remember fondly from your youth that there are some odd things. Like, I thought to myself, hey, maybe I'll just try to get to, like, the big Las vegas -y area. And the second you get to the Las vegas -y area, you get, like, an, 
a, a, a four star crime rating and just everybody attacks you like no you're not supposed to go there yet makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> i know that it's the way the gameplay of gta usually goes but it it really didn't make much sense um i just feel bad for gta san andreas it's what i feel bad for this is definitely not a better version than the original and i think that it does a disservice to the original in a lot of ways what could possibly be worse than that Number 27 is, is actually like a game preview, and I did play it, and I, I kind of don't want to play it again. It's called Anvil Vault Breaker, and uh, the, the general idea is, I don't know, you know, like just go through this one instance level with either yourself or other people, kill a bunch of monsters... The the point is, though, I, I tried a few different outfits for the anvil fighter that you have, and it doesn't help that it also looks a lot like Anthem, but from a top-down hack-and-slashy but shootery, looter-shooter model, I didn't find anything that really sang to me, and I felt like it was just not enjoyable. Let's just put it to you that way. The gameplay loop is not enjoyable. Yeah. I, I, I don't have anything else to say about Anvil. Undungeon, I was really hoping, was going to be good. You wander this landscape with this cool-looking, almost like, you know, Ghost of Future pe present. Or, no. Ghost of Future. Ghost of the Future. <laughs> kind of looking with the robes and everything. Uh, and you're going around this landscape, and it's sort of like a, a pseudo 2.5D, uh, like a hack and slashy kind of game. But the problem is, is that it's, it doesn't control very well, your character moves incredibly slow, and the objectives seem kind of muddled. There is also like a timer in here, so like it takes you so many days to get from point A to point B, so everything's trying to be on a timer, which would be fine. But I never really saw where that actually played into the game. Like, I didn't see where my penalties would be. The layout of the whole thing is a little bit sad, honestly, and just your powers and your abilities and what you can and can't do is very muddled. It's bad because it doesn't tell you how it cannot be bad, and so it's up to the player to figure out how to make the game fun, and I didn't enjoy that. Dandy Ace is trying to be Hades. But with a magician, it is so trying to be Hades. You have this uh, roguelike loop where you go for a while, and if you can't do it, you have to go back to the start, and uh, there's going to be more narrative, and you're going to find out who this rival is, but the rival is boring. It's just like another magician that doesn't like that you're so good at your job. There's a point where you can uh, upgrade your stuff at a certain points, and it's just the Dandy Ace's two assistants, and you can have interactions with them, and then you move on, and then you fight, like, bunnies and top hats and stuff, and it's all themed that way. I did not like this, <laughs> and I did not enjoy it, and I put it down quickly. Uh, 30 is Cyber Shadow, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I forgot I had even played this game. I don't really know if I can even explain it, I think it's a, like more of a Metroid title, but you're a samurai? Ninja? Something. Anyway, point is, I apparently played it, but I can't remember much about it. And that pretty much tells you everything you need to know. Alright, we've come to number 31. We've reached the bottom. And at the bottom is Skatebird. Skatebird is is trying to be Tony Hawk, but where you're a bird on a skateboard. Now, I'm going to be honest. When I first heard about this game, I was so excited. This looked amazing, right? It's, it's a skateboarding game with a bird. Oh my god, this is the greatest thing ever. Tony Hawk, but like actual hawks. Excellent. Until you actually play the game. Because, see, I'm a big fan of the extreme sports titles. And I know what to expect from them. 
I know what I expect from them. Skatebird does not deliver in that in any way, shape, or form. There are two main components that you have to have down pat to make a good, even a serviceable extreme sports game. You need a camera that follows the action correctly and you need tight, tight controls. The controls in Skatebird are horrible. They're just horrible. I was trying to work out how I did most things, and there is a, a just a looseness to these controls and a, a real question mark when you go to do things in the game that I was not happy with. But then, oh, the camera. The camera, I, I think that the camera is being controlled by a hummingbird that had way too much caffeine. Because it is just all over the place. And the second you get into an enclosed area, it cannot seem to figure out where it wants to be. Now, you can do some manual controls to this, but the manual controls are also just screwing the whole thing up. Yeah, They're, they're, they're just like trying to take you behind walls and into things. It, it doesn't really work. And I thought to myself, maybe, 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 I just have changed my tastes. Like, maybe I don't love extreme sports games anymore. But you know, very recently during the Epic sale, I picked up Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2. Because I was super excited to see what they did with a remake of those titles. And the second I got in to that very first level, that warehouse, I realized, nope, I still like this. I still like this genre. This is good. So it's not that. It's just that the game is real bad. And with the potential that they had, it's a skateboarding game where you play a bird. And you flubbed it. How? Okay, folks. That was a very long and exhausting list that I just did. Thank you for sticking with me through it. I hope you took something away from it. I do plan on having a uh, another video later where I talk about games that I would very much like to play from 2021 that I just never got around to, as well as some that I originally thought came out in 2021, only to realize actually they came out earlier and I just, just was not aware of them. But we're going to do that as a supplemental piece. For right now, thank you for running down this list of 31 games. I think my brain is broken now, and I'm going to go sleep. So you have a lovely day. Thank you for joining us here in the Citanium Mine, and we will talk to you next time. If I'm still awake, uh, I shudder to think what this list is going to look like for 2022.